on this Thursday edition of the OFN Today. Olin Buchanan, <clears throat> Texas A&M football columnist at texags.com is here to help preview the Aggies' big game this week in Alabama. Meanwhile, Ted Zavransky of covers.com will also stop by to preview three college football and three NFL games this week, including the battle for L.A. in the NFL on Sunday. As the OFN Today on the Lads Football Radio Network starts now. All right, it's Thursday, September 20th, 2018. I'm Greg DePama. Thanks for tuning in to the OFN Today. The OFN Today is brought to you by rlads.com, providing the best pro and college football depth charts on the net. Storestreams.com, the Store Streams music service, offers a complete solution for restaurants, bars, and hotels, as well as retailers of all size in need of background music for their business. Storestreams.com music service plans start at just $20 a month. And Covers.com, featuring live score stats and odds, and is considered the most convenient and entertaining source for sports news and facts with over 45 million visits a year. Don't forget, you can also email us here on the show, OFN at PrimeSportsNetwork.com, with your questions or comments. You can also follow us on Twitter at PrimeSN. Same thing, questions, comments, send us a message. And you can also follow our first guest at Olin Buchanan, and uh, Olin's been with us uh, several times, uh, even just lately, to help us to talk Texas A&M football and SEC football. So, Olin, thanks a lot to, talk, uh, to take your time out to talk to us again. It's a big week for A&M football. Well, absolutely is. It, uh, it's been a tough month, you know, playing Clemson just two weeks ago. Yeah. And how often do you, you play the number two team in the nation? And then two weeks later, you play the number one team. So, And this time on the road. Yeah. So it's a, another big challenge for the Aggies. Well, uh, but the first one, you throw out the fact that the team didn't win. You couldn't have imagined a better loss, really. I mean, there's, I know there's no such thing as a good loss. We always hear that. Uh, but that, that, and, and you know what? Maybe that is, is a loss that will be forgotten quickly if the team doesn't show up on Saturday night. But I actually think they are because I, th- I liked them in that game against Clemson. I actually, I, I, it wasn't like I had liked a lot of games. I'll be honest with you, as upsets that week, but I did pick that as my upset. I, I, I really like what I saw to Kellen Mond coming into that game. He looked like he was just transformed. Uh, I know he hadn't played anybody other than Northwestern State, but it still looked he looked the part. And boy, did he look the part against Clemson, and and so did Kendrick Rogers, wide receiver who stepped up and had a huge game. So I think they're for real. I think there's going to be a good football game on Saturday. Yeah, I think so, too. I think uh, what happened when, yeah, you know, there are no moral victories at Texas A&M, and uh, they're not going to celebrate a 28-26 loss to, even to a, a great team like Clemson. I think more than anything, though, it, it kind of changed the perception that other people had of Texas A&M to look at it and say, hey, uh, th- this team might be better than we thought. And now you see A&M ranked 22nd, uh, and a big part of that, I mean, really probably all of it is because of, of, of that loss. Sure. Um, that said, again, no one's going to celebrate a loss here, and they're going to go to Alabama understanding that they're a huge underdog, and uh, you know, no one expects them to win, and rightly so. But like you said, Kellen Mond is, a, uh, 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 in my mind, a rising star. Uh, did some really good things as a true freshman when he wasn't even expected to play. Uh, did take some lumps like you expect true freshmen uh, freshmen to do. And then he's got a lot of young talent around him, a bunch of sophomore receivers that are playing well, uh, a really good running back with uh, and, and Travion Williams. Yep. And, you know, a defense is getting better. So, uh, you know, they're going to go out there. And uh, I don't think you look at this game and say, oh, a and just coming in as a lamb to the slaughter. Uh, I think they they can go in and they have the ability to, uh, you know, to, to put a pretty competitive game against a and M. I mean, I'm sorry, against Alabama. And if uh, everything falls just right and the Lord's smiling on them, maybe they'll have a chance to duplicate that 2012 upset that Johnny Manziel engineered, and you know, maybe have a chance to to, to get out of there with a win. Yeah, you never know. I mean, uh, we we have seen Alabama. Uh, I mean, matter of fact, I, I know it, they're different programs, but last week going over the Oklahoma Iowa State game, 
Uh, we were talking about how Oklahoma hadn't lost uh, on the road since 2014, which is really unusual. Uh, Alabama, they lost to Mississippi, of course, a few years ago and had really great games and matchups uh, with Mississippi there for a few years. And I think that why, why couldn't that same thing happen to Texas A&M? Why can't this be the beginning with Mond as a sophomore and Fisher's first year? Why can't this be the beginning of one of those types of uh, tough matchups for Alabama, which I completely expect it to be? How, does the, how, how, does, how do you think just being around from what, what, what you've seen so far this season and, in, and just the last year or two from, from the, the, the cast of characters, the main guys that are going to be out there fighting it uh, tooth and nail to try to get the win for the Aggies, their, their attitude as far as their confidence level and, and how they're conducting themselves uh, in, in a matchup that nobody expects them to win? Well, I think they are a competent football team, and I think a lot of times when you go into a game, or a season where people don't expect you to win, you know, you you can be that team that just you know going to going to play out the string, or or uh, that team that maybe feels disrespected and plays with a chip on your shoulder, wanting to prove something. And I think that's the kind of team they have, the team that feels like they're better than they're given credit for, and uh, want to go out and prove it. I mean, they've got some NFL players on on this roster. You know, Kingsley Kiki at defensive end is going to, I think, is going to be a pretty high draft choice. Uh, maybe not a first-round pick because there's so many of them that's going to be in the draft next year. But, I mean, he's a really good player. David yep. Mack at defensive tackles finally showing signs of becoming the player uh, that they thought he'd be when he was a five-star recruit uh, four or five, uh, I guess it was four years ago. Hmm. Uh, we talked about Kellen Mon and, and Kendrick uh, Rogers at receiver. Jamon Osborn is another receiver that's really uh, uh, has come along. Of course, he had 50 catches last year as a freshman. Uh, you know, Jay Sternberger, a tight end, junior college transfers, really added to the offense. Um, Donovan Wilson at, uh, uh, and Tyrell Dotson on defense. I mean, those are some big-time players. So, so they have some guys that can go out and uh, will probably play on Sunday and can go out and play really well against any competition. I understand that if you've been watching A&M closely and if you've been watching Alabama closely, you're going to say, hey, Alabama is going to win this by a uh, – pretty big margin because of the uh, uh, Tua Tonga Vailoa and that, that quick strike offense of theirs, that big play offense. And A&M has been subject uh, to giving up big plays, usually because of uh, the cornerbacks getting deep and people are going to, uh, or getting beat. And people are going to say, hey, if, if, if uh, a and is giving up big plays to Northwestern State and Louisiana Monroe, you know, what's Alabama and those guys going to do to them? And that's a valid point. Sure. Uh, but uh, I think you'll see – Mike Elko come in with a scheme that's going to maybe not put put his corners in man-to-man coverage as much, try to disguise things, try to confuse uh, Tua, see if, uh, uh, if maybe they can catch him by surprise with some blitzes and all of those kind of things. And, uh, you know, if Mike Elko is successful, you know, maybe they can keep it close and get into the fourth quarter uh, as a competitive game. And then you think, you know, who knows what will happen. Put the pressure on. That's, uh, yeah. Right. I, I know. Well, I don't think Alabama will – will uh, crumble under any pressure at all. But, you know, maybe if you can get into the fourth quarter with it being uh, still having a chance, you know, maybe A&M will surprise people make a uh, make a big play here and there. Um, I, I know that's probably the, the way the uh, A&M coaches are, are approaching it. Well, I mean, and the reason I brought up the Oklahoma uh, comparison and even mentioned uh, Alabama losing to Mississippi at home a couple of years ago is because Oklahoma's lost some big games at home or just games at home recently. Uh, I mean, look, we saw Clemson over the last few years struggle at home at times to teams that they're supposed to win. And I bring this up because it, it, in any sport, it always seems like the really top programs, actually, they're, they're the top programs, be, and, and they're, they're the ones, for, and I'm talking about the ones that, are, that are, are, are good for a long time, and they usually are because when they go out on the road, they just seem to be a better team than they actually are at home. I mean, when they're at home, of course, they're just really good, and, and, and they usually, you know, it, it, everything comes a little bit more easily. But it always, especially in football, it takes a special team program to be dominant for so long. And to be that type of team, you have to win on the road repeatedly. And, and Alabama's done that. And I think sometimes they're a little bit more, they can be a little bit more susceptible at home 
uh, which is why I give him, uh, which is another reason I give the Aggies a shot in this game. So uh, g- give me a matchup uh, for uh, for the game when, you, when you're taking a look at, again, what you've seen. You talked about some of the deficiencies, but g- give me something where you think Texas a and might be able to exploit in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I know it's tough to say that with Alabama. They've looked explosive offensively. But is there anything where if they stop Alabama, you'll go, okay, that, that, that scheme set, that Elko, you know, that, that, that move, uh, that, that was something that I, I think uh, was coming, and, and now it's working. Well, again, I think um, what, what the Aggies are hopeful for is that as good as Tua Tonga Vailoa is, he's still just a sophomore that's, what, making his uh, – third start true or fourth fourth start and so i think what they're hoping is that they that, that they can do some things schematically that may be confusing here and there uh i think a&m uh, is as good yeah i don't know that i could look at anything and say okay a&m has an advantage there i mean this is alabama yeah it's sure several, you know defending national chance but i do think a&m with their defensive line can match up well against Alabama. I don't think I'm going to look at that matchup and say, oh, my gosh, uh, Alabama has this, you know, this decided advantage and they're going to dominate up front. I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think a and is actually pretty good in the front seven or uh, definitely front four and in the front seven as well. Um, so, so make so, him one-dimensional. Uh, make the young quarterback one-dimensional, and the more one-dimensional he is, then hopefully the more mistakes he'll make. Yeah, and I don't even know that you can make them one-dimensional with Damian Harris back there. But you know, you want to contain them and uh, you know put him in a in, in obvious passing situations as much as possible if you can. They actually did a pretty good job on Damian William uh, Harris last year. He did rip off a 75-yard touchdown run early in the game. After that, they they they, they were pretty solid against him. A and M's going to have to really limit the big plays they allow. And of course, it sounds like a coach. And it sounds like coach speak, but they're going to have to limit the big plays, and they can't afford turnovers. A and M is actually, uh, with the exception of 2014, when they went to Tuscaloosa and got beat 59 nothing. Um, the rest of the games since A and M has moved into the SEC have been rather competitive. Yeah, and uh, and uh, you know turnovers uh, that they've given up, and very often going for scores have really turned out to be the difference in the game. So A and M obviously has to take care of the ball, and I think uh, the. That, that, that a lot of that rests on Kellen Mond, obviously, as quarterback, and he hasn't thrown an interception this year. And last year he had an interception against Alabama and also lost a fumble at the end of about a 14-yard run. So uh, he has great ability if he just takes care of the ball and maybe uh, uh, throw it away instead of a 50-50 ball here and there um, and, keep, and keep A&M uh, turnovers at a minimum, uh, then I think the Aggies will have a shot. But I don't know that I could look at any – uh, match up and say, you know, I think A and M has the edge here because yeah. Alabama is just that talented. Yeah. We don't know that. Sure. And, uh, and, and look, uh, in college, I don't care what anybody says, unless uh, you're a defending uh, national champion like Alabama and you're bringing back 20 starters, every team goes through changes. Every team has a new identity. Sure, there are key guys that Alabama has, is bringing back, especially a quarterback and running back. But the fact is, there's a lot of guys that are, have not played and, and, been, uh, and been the guys that have had to step up on defense and be the men, be the big guys that have to make the big plays. And they haven't played anybody this year. So, uh, so, and, and if and if Texas A&M wins this game, you got to believe that it's going to be somewhere in the twenties minimum, if not in the thirties. It would have to be something like a thirty-eight, thirty-five type game because, like you said, it's just you're not going to stop Alabama offensively. But I do think Texas A&M uh, might might be able to put up some points against Alabama, and that's I think where uh, where I I can see it being a close game. Well, I, I can too, and uh, uh, you know. Fisher's a smart guy. He's not, you know, he's going to try to find some some areas where they at least, uh, you know, match up well, and then try to go there. I don't think he's going to be running into the teeth of a Alabama defense that, uh, you know, I, I, do you want to run right at Raquan Davis or, uh, you know, some, and just take your chance? No, I think he's going to look for some areas where where they can be successful. And you got to redefine success in a game like this, you know. Um, Maybe uh, you look at it and say a four-yard gain is a, is a win, and if you can sure. string, enough along, uh, string enough of those along, uh, along, then you can, uh, you know, maybe get a uh, uh, a long drive together and uh, keep uh, to a ta- uh, tackle vo- by a lower off the field, which will always be a good thing. Um, but 
again, uh, they realize the, 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 the challenge they're facing. And, and uh, I know that Alabama uh, probably hasn't played the, the toughest competition yet. Uh, I do think a and is going to be the best team they will have faced sure. to, this, to this point. Yep. But by the same token, they have dominated everybody. Oh, yeah, they've done what they're supposed to. They're still a great <laughs> team. We know that. So Yeah, so, so uh, look, for a and to win, they're going to have to play uh, about as – I don't want to say perfect because no one plays a perfect game, but they're going to have to minimize turnovers and uh, – uh, yeah, you, and you can't have like those content. plays like at the end of the game against Clemson, even though they still scored. But what I said about that game is in that situation is that even though, uh, which I thought was a bad call, you know, the, the end zone uh, official, uh, you know, saying that, you know, the ball was knocked out over the end zone. Right. Uh, what, what really killed them in, the, in that situation was the time that went off the clock. Because if they score there and, and, and don't get the two points and then hold Clemson, then they get the ball back with a minute or change left and they could kick a field goal to win the game. That's where it was lost, where some people might look at, yeah, but they still, they still had a chance to tie the game anyway. But, but that's how big that play really affected the game for them. They can't have those types of things happen if they're going to beat a team like Alabama. Oh, no question. And, you know, you don't, you're not going to get that many opportunities to score against Alabama. So when you do hit those opportunities, you have to capitalize on them. They did have that uh, Courtney um, Davis fumble, and they did miss a, a, a field goal and had another one blocked against sure. Clemson. So you've got to clean those things up and understand that, hey, every uh, opportunity is so valuable and so rare that you've got to capitalize on them. And if they do that, and, and, you know, then maybe they'll have a shot. Uh, last thing before I let you go, uh, I mentioned Rodgers. Uh, how big of a surprise is this? Uh, that he uh, This happens all the time anyway in college football. You, you never know when these kids are going to step up. So uh, h- how good can he be? You know, I would say it was a, a, a modest surprise, a mild surprise, and he has a, a potential to be really good. They, uh, the previous coaching staff that brought him in here was really high on him. Uh, right away, he's six foot five. He has a thirty-six inch vertical leap. Uh, has good speed, but uh, last year he didn't play a lot. And when he was, and the reason why his uh, hands were unreliable. There were times when, uh, quite frankly, he just dropped balls when he had a chance to make plays. And uh, so, um, coming into this year, you know, he wasn't one of the guys you looked at that said, "Hey, you know, he could be do a, a breakout year." You knew he had ability, but he hadn't showed the he hadn't shown the ability to, I guess maybe it's a mental thing. Sure. But so then he comes out uh, in that Clemson game, and not only is he making routine catches, but he's making circus catches. He had one, you saw it, uh, where he used every bit of his six foot five frame and, and reach to pull down a touchdown pass. And then another one, great concentration to, for a touchdown uh, to catch a ball deflected off of Stanford, I'm, I'm sorry, of, of uh, Clemson defender's hand. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a guy that. Again, they always felt like, uh, you know, both coaching staffs felt like he was a guy that had great uh, potential, great tools. It just had to put it together, and it looks like it might be coming together this year. It certainly was in that in that Clemson game. All right, Olin, I appreciate it. Uh, again, you can follow Olin at Olin Buchanan, and uh, uh, good luck on Saturday. Either way, I think it's going to be a successful season for Texas A&M, and let's keep this in mind. That, uh, and I know they're in the same division as Alabama, so that's the bummer, uh, but uh, you never know. Uh, even one loss in the SEC doesn't rule you, you, you rule you out of the SEC championship game, so anything is possible. Uh, best of luck, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again uh, sometime uh, you know, later on down the road this season. Okay, I'll look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Olin. All right, that's Olin Buchanan. And uh, Olin, uh, again, was with us to preview uh, not only Texas A&M football before the season began, and by the way, that is available on demand if you want to go inside Texas A&M football, but also the SEC. Uh, He did a great job. Uh, We went over uh, the SEC and every conference in college football uh, this season, uh, before the season started, and uh, Olin uh, was the writer and contributor that I uh, called upon to come on the air and talk about the SEC. So anyway, uh, good luck uh, to Texas A&M. And uh, good luck. If you're an Alabama fan, give me a break. What, do, do you need any luck? No. Uh, do, do you, I mean, I don't even know. I, I've never experienced a championship. Well, college, I have one each in basketball and football. But I haven't really experienced anything, of course, remotely close to what's going on in New England and Alabama 
uh, recently. So I don't know what that feeling is, but I still feel, knowing myself, that if my team had won whatever, five championships in eight years or, or even five championships in ten years or whatever the case may be, uh, sorry, but yeah, would I enjoy the seasons? Yes, of course I would. Uh, but would I sweat things out? No. I mean, come on. You know, I mean, if, if like if there are any Alabama fans, like if Texas A&M takes a lead in this game, let's say it's the second half, and Texas A&M takes a lead in this game, if I see, and I will, if I see any Alabama fans with some frowns on their faces, I mean, give me a break, unless you got big money on the game, all right? And, and you shouldn't have big money on a fourth touchdown game. So give me a break. All right, I don't want to see any frowns from Alabama. That's like, that's like Patriot fans frowning because their team like, is, is trailing at a football game. I mean, get over it. I mean, because even Alabama has proven that you can even lose a game. I mean, even if Alabama, by some miracle, loses the game, what are you frowning about? First, I wouldn't frown over anything for the next five years if I was an Alabama fan anyway. And secondly, what would I frown over? I could just run the table and, and, and not even get to the SEC championship game again. And, oh, I'll get voted into the, into the playoffs one more time because that's the way the committee acts. You know, they want who they want in there. So, uh, anyway, that's just my thought there. But uh, great job by Owen Buchanan. Uh, again, uh, uh, check him out at texagsags.com, uh, Texas A&M football columnist. And I'm sure we'll have him on uh, again during the season. Uh, by the way, I'll definitely get him on next week if Texas A&M wins this football game. And I do think this game is going to be close. I really do. Uh, I-, I was that impressed with Texas A&M. My money line... Outright double digit upset pick against Clemson that just lost. So, but I won't be picking them to win this game because uh, I don't even think there's a money line on the game, right, Teddy? There's no money line on a 28 point game unless you're in Vegas, I guess. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, at this stage, there's money lines on just about every game. I'm just looking for it uh, right now, real quick. Give me just a second and I'll track it down for you. But sports books, right? I know, I know the sports books I've ever gone to, they, they don't provide 28 point money lines. Yeah. It's, it's not something you're going to find at m- most books, but there's a handful of books here in Vegas that offer them. I'm looking oh, yeah, at three sure. right now and, and a handful offshore. I'm seeing uh Texas A&M anywhere from 20 to one to 30 <laughs> to one to win the game. <laughs> That's just to win the one game. That is crazy. I, I'll get, you know, if I'm in Vegas, I'm, I'm walking into the casino. I put ten bucks on that. I mean, uh, I, I, because I just, I do think this game is going to be a good game. So anyway, uh, I don't know what kind of chances you give any and You think this game will be a game in the second half? I'm very reluctant to stand in front of Alabama. Alabama, this is good a college Alabama. football team. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, but you know what, Teddy? Let me say this. Uh, Every year, uh-huh. everybody says the same thing about Alabama. They said it last year. No. And Al- no, I heard it last year. From me? No, I heard it on all the media, the national media, how great I Alabama is. I don't listen to any is. national media. Okay, no, well, I'm just, that. I mean, I'm just, if you want to get a dumber at, watch, at college football, listen to the national well, that's, media. That's why, I, that's why I like Flat doing out. it. That's why I enjoy doing it, because I like making fun of them on the air. <laughs> okay, yeah, of course. Yeah. That, 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 that's fair enough. But I, I literally, I find any time I watch any national show on college football, I finish <laughs> that hour or half hour dumber than when I started. I mean, you know, so, they've really <laughs> ruined, uh, I, and maybe it's just because because uh, Lee Corso is like 90 years old, but I, I don't know, maybe because I'm older, but I mean, I used to watch that show 15, 20 years ago, and it was okay. I, I enjoyed it. Now I put it on, it's like I, I, I'm not learning anything with these guys. If anything, they're just making my ears hurt. Yeah, well, the, the, this is the truth of it, okay? You do college football every day. That's true. All year round. That's true. You know more than anybody else out there that's talking on national TV about college football. The guys who are talking about college football, even the stars who played it, they don't follow it the no, way you or I do. They no. really don't. So They're lazy. When you know more than the guys on TV, or the talking heads are saying, guess what? You don't watch the guys on TV. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is that in this game, and look, they've got a couple of star players like Raekwon Davis and Anthony Jennings, and they're proven guys. I, you know, but uh, every time, you know, it's college football, and every time you do need to see, okay, if this game is a close game in the second half, let, let's see, you know, who, who, who's going to be the new players that are going to step up for Alabama 
and uh, be the next stars on defense. I mean, it happens all the time. I mean, that's what Saban does. Uh, but they got to do it. They got to go out there and prove it uh, because they're going to still they're going to score a ton of points in every game. When you got these quarterbacks and, and and Harris and the receivers and the offensive line, you're not stopping Alabama. No, and that's what's different about this year's Alabama team is that in years past, you know, that offense has been hit or miss at times. The quarterback play has been hit or miss at times. Tua is ridiculous. Okay, he's as good a college quarterback as I've seen this side of you know Vince Young. <laughs> uh, I mean, you have to go back a decade, you know, for for a QB that was playing at, at this type of level. And I understand Alabama recruits and recruits and recruits and recruits, and it doesn't matter, you know, they they, they, they reloads, not rebuilds, and all of that. But I mean, there's literally NFL talent at the backup spot at every position for Alabama this year, offense and defense. That is depth that is downright scary. It's the best college football team I've seen since USC and Texas. Uh, and I will not step in front of Alabama. All right, Kellen Mond, yada, yada, yada. Did you see what Bama did to Ole Miss last week? <laughs> Ole Miss is good. They can move the football. And I understand that Alabama, there's no value. I'm not laying it with Alabama, but I will not step in front of that team. No way. All right, let's talk about some of the games that we have on our schedule. And uh, let's we got two Big Ten games, so let's uh, get with the first one. Wisconsin coming off a loss to BYU. It's about a three, three-and-a-half-point favorite at Iowa. This is a night game. Uh, this is the Big Ten opener for both teams. This is a West showdown, two of the favorites in the West. Now, Wisconsin's loss, again, it was not a Big Ten game, so uh, there, there's that. Of course, for a national championship, I still don't think, and I'm look, Wisconsin didn't win in a national championship, uh, but just if you're a fan and you have hopes, uh, that, that they, could, they could still run the table, uh, beat Ohio State in a championship game and still get to the playoffs, so don't worry about that. For Iowa, I think this is one of the better Iowa teams they've had, and, 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 and the reason is, is because they have a quarterback now and Nathan Stanley who's getting better every year. Uh, Ferenc is a great coach. Uh, th- th- Iowa, we know at night they love to upset everybody, even though it's only a three-point spread, so it's not that classic major upset that, they, that we're used to. Uh, but Wisconsin's 5-1 and one in their last six against Iowa, and they've won three straight in Iowa. So they've owned this series over the last few years, and it's, uh, it is going to be kind of hard to believe that the Badgers will lose two straight. Uh, but I think Iowa's uh, – this is a tough game to call. This is, uh, is going to be a really close game, don't you think? Uh, it wasn't close last year, uh, and it was a blowout last year. And uh, uh, what was the final? Of the last? Give me one second. Uh, like 38-14. 30, yeah, 38-14 last year, 17-9 to in 2016. And you like Nathan Stanley more than I do. Uh, you know, I've watched Stanley for a year and a half right now, and he's, a, he's another stiff. I mean, the Hawkeyes keep on putting out, you know, it's been this way at Iowa. They have not been able to recruit quarterbacks for some time. And that's why the program is an 8-9 win program and not a 10-11 win program is because of the quarterback play. And I watch Stanley and I go, this guy, you know, he can't move the football against Iowa State, can't complete simple passes. And he's hit on a handful of big plays uh, this year. He spread the ball around, which is something he wasn't doing last year. But the Iowa passing game lacks explosiveness, and third and seven is a mountain for that team. It, it really is. And the other issue I have with the Hawkeyes I mean, again, Wisconsin just ran right over him last year. And Jonathan Taylor's, what, 6.7 yards per carry yeah, sure. uh, so far this season. That is a better in offensive line. I don't know what Iowa can game plan differently defensively to stop Wisconsin from running the football. Taylor's going to get his in this ball game, and Iowa's got no way to come from behind. If they fall behind, they're hopeless. Uh, so... And by would, the way, they did it last year uh, with Josie Jewell on the, on the on the field for Iowa, and now now he's not even there, and he's only like the best defensive player in the Big Ten last year. So point well taken. So that being said, that being said, I'd rather have the Badgers in this ball game. I, sure. I, and what, what, what worth noting, Paul Christ has had seven previous losses at Wisconsin. Following those games, the Badgers seven and zero straight up. Sorry, six and one straight up, seven and zero oh against the spread. There you go. So that's uh, yeah, it's going to be tough for us because look, if Iowa wins this game, then uh, you would think that they are the they are definitely 
uh, not just the leaders on paper, but they are the leaders to win this division because uh, right now, if you look at like Northwestern, nope, they're not going to do it. Purdue, after a good season last season, nope, they're not going to do it. I mean, the only way Purdue could do it is if this Blaw kid, you know, uh, actually keeps playing like he did last week. Uh, and the only team that I think that has a shot in this division is actually Nebraska because they get Martinez back. And uh, by the way, has that line drastically changed? No. In Wh- fact, with Martinez back, or upgraded to probable, uh, the line went, yawn, we don't care, no difference between the two what's, what's the money line on that? I'm putting money on Nebraska on the money line. What is that? I wouldn't tell you. You can get plus 700 if you shop around. I'm definitely doing that. You know, it's a plus, uh, the railing line plus six, And by the way, uh, I'm a Michigan fan. Plus 650. And I'm a Michigan fan. But I'm doing that mm-hmm. because I'm a realist. Because Adrian Martinez is a fantastic young player. Uh, I don't care what they did last week because uh, the, they had a walk-on who I, I think you, know, you or I could have done better than him. So uh, that, that meant nothing to me. So, uh, yeah, I, I think Nebraska might be the one team that has a shot if, uh, if, if, if Wisconsin's vulnerable. Uh, by the way, I said this on my show the other day. Uh, you talk about Iowa's quarterback situation, and Paul Chris is a good coach. But three years in a row of Alex Hornibrook, you can't find another quarterback? I mean, oh, and Hornibrook's a guy that came in with an impeccable rep. Re- you know, he was like a top 20 prospect. He was supposed to be their best QB in two decades. <laughs> I know. Um, and he hasn't gotten a whole lot better I know. since he's been Nothing. there. Nothing. No Hornibrook, improvement. Nothing. Hornibrook can throw a deep ball. You know, in, in a way that uh, that Stanley can't. Uh, I'll give him credit for that. I'm not sure if the Badgers have great pass catchers either. No, neither team does. It's yeah. uh, it's going to be a pretty uh, ugly game to watch, to tell you the truth. Okay, let's go to the other Big Ten game. Michigan State at Indiana. And uh, Michigan State has dominated this series, uh, but that's kind of par for the course. They've won 8 out of 9. They've uh, covered 7 out of 9. Big Ten opener for both teams. Tom Allen is doing a very good job at Indiana. Uh, because uh, it was just a few years ago, as you know, uh, covering college football, that Indiana was like Duke, you know, that, okay, they could put points on the board, but they couldn't stop anybody. Uh, Now, all of a sudden, because of the hiring of Tom Allen, Indiana can play some defense, and that's why they're winning even games a couple years ago they couldn't win. But now they got to step up, play a Michigan State team that, of course, had a very disappointing loss, you know, 120-degree temperatures at Arizona State. They had the week off to prepare for this one. I I really like this Michigan State team. I think they're going to be much better. I know they haven't played particularly well the first two games, but they've underachieved a little. Uh, the spread is only five. I'm not going to say this is going to be a blowout because I think Indiana is a pretty decent team and they're at home. But five points isn't too bad in college. I would definitely take Michigan State if I was going to take the game. Well, and we're going to disagree on this one as well. Uh, even though, I mean, from a program Well, I didn't pers- take Iowa. I, I said uh, I'd stay away from uh, the game. Uh, yeah, I, I, would, I, I would lean towards Indiana as a home dog here because, okay. I mean, this is what we've seen from Michigan State so far this season. Okay, We have a program, I'm not going to call them in decline, but... D'Antoni had a uh, D'Antonio had a really nice recruiting edge in the state of Michigan during the Rich Rod era and into the Brady Hoke era, and all that ended when Jim Harbaugh uh, arrived in Ann Arbor, and all of a sudden the Wolverines started getting all the best in-state talent like they used to back in the day. So the recruiting pipeline shut down a little bit for East, uh, in East Lansing. How's that working out? Uh, well, they're not in a Michigan, series at least. <laughs> Uh, Michigan, I mean, Michigan is a better program right now. Michigan is a better team this year. I know, year, but they so. can't beat them. Well, it's been fluky. Let's just put okay, it that way. Okay, I agree, but I don't know, so, you know. And the sample size is small. But the the Spartan program, you know, we talk about programs on the rise, and on, you know, like in Oregon that was here and now is declining. Spartans were here and now they're declining, you know. Uh, and we saw the game against Utah State in the opener. I mean, the Aggies moved the ball up and down the field against Michigan State. We saw Arizona State in the uh, in in game two, game on the line, fourth quarter. Spartans' offense doesn't work; their defense doesn't work. This is not what I'm used to seeing from the better Michigan State teams. And Indiana, solid man. You look at that program: three, four, five I mean, wins over the last ten years. Three, four, five, one, four, five, four, six, six, and five. No winning seasons during that entire span when they made a bowl. They ended up losing their bowl game, but. This year's Hoosiers team is probably the best of the last decade, and you talk about that defense. It's pretty good. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, 
Uh, you're right. I mean, I, I, I haven't bet Indiana. I, I probably wouldn't bet Indiana at less than a touchdown. But uh, we've seen a little bit of money start trickling in on Sparty. And if we see a little bit more, I'll probably look towards the Well, look, the side. last couple of years, the, the games have been close. You know, I mean, last year, uh, even in Michigan State, and they had a nice year last year, it was an eight-point game. And when they played in Indiana two years ago, uh, Indiana beat them. That game was in yeah. overtime. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I, I could say see, five points is – Again, NFL, it's a lot bigger than college. It's the only reason why I said I would take Michigan State. But I could easily see this game being another three-point, four-point you know, win for Michigan State. I, look, I, yeah, I, I think we are definitely going to disagree because I do like this Michigan State team. Uh, I, they're, they're, and they don't have the talent like you said. There ain't no doubt about that. They only get like two stars and three stars now. But uh, I do like what they have, and they do a really good job of developing their players well. Uh, I think they have completely underachieved so far this season, and now with the bye week, I expect them to play a lot better. And I think they're going to be a very competitive team uh, later on this season, but we'll see. This is a great test uh, to find out whether or not I'm wrong or not. Uh, let's sure, go, go ahead. Okay, so no, go ahead. I was, was going to say, there, there's a clear, in my mind, there's a clear class difference between the top three in the Big uh, Ten East with Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State. And Michigan State, I think, is is, is not okay. competing with those programs anymore. I'm. Uh, I need to see more proof out of Michigan, my own team. I'm. I'm just. Uh, it's, 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 there's something still wrong with that team right now. Uh, let's get to Stanford and Oregon. Let's go out west where you are. I'm always going to go with these West games with you. So Oregon and Stanford. And Stanford was my pick to win the uh, Pac-12 this season, and so far. I got no reason to not like them. Uh, I'm still not completely so. I know Washington played well against Auburn, but that Utah game was ugly. Uh, Stanford, the offense hasn't exactly looked like a juggernaut. I think a lot of that has to do. There must be something wrong with Bryce Love. Uh, he's just not. I know that defenses are trying to do whatever they can to stop Love, and they're, they're jamming the line of scrimmage. But I've seen Love on several occasions this season when he has gotten you know, by the first wave He'll get one guy in front of him, and he can't get by him. That's, there's something wrong with him because he's a fantastic football player. Uh, so maybe by not playing against UC Davis, a couple of weeks off, that kind of thing, maybe that'll get him going again because they can't win these types of games uh, without him at his very best. It's lucky they got Costello and our Sega Whiteside. That's still a very good combination. I'm not sold on the Stanford defense yet. This is a big test at Oregon, but to tell you the truth, I'm not sold on Oregon either, except for Justin Herbert, who's a fantastic young player. This is a big game for him uh, to find out if he's as, every bit as talented as a lot of people at Oregon believe he is. Yeah, 49-7 to Stanford last year. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it was about as ugly a loss as Oregon has you know, had in the last two decades. Uh, and it's one they certainly remember, and, uh, and this time they get uh, the Cardinal at Altson. But you know, Bryce Love has a one 59-yard touchdown scamper. His other 39 carries, uh, he's got like 106 yards. Yeah, not good. So, but we saw both Sandy. I mean, San Diego State did it. I mean, San Diego State had 10 men in the box on every play. They did. They said Costello beat us, and he did. And he did. And then USC had nine guys in the box on every play. They said Costello <laughs> beat us, and you know, David Shaw played conservative. <laughs> and he didn't but have he to did. do anything because USC did nothing. Exactly. You know, they, they didn't have to push the pedal to the metal in that ball game. From all indications, Bryce Love is fine. I was reading a bunch of stuff from the local papers this week. They said he, you know, he missed last week. There was an undisclosed injury. Uh, it looked like they were just sitting him uh, and see if they could get him fresh and some spring in his step yeah, he for needs that. this match. I mean, they absolutely will need Bryce Love yeah. uh, in this ball game. Oregon's such an interesting team to consider. You know, they had three blowout wins over three lesser foes oh, yeah. coming to the campaign. And in Vegas, we tend to devalue that. You know, I've been out here 20 years, and what you hear, I hear it every time I walk on the sports book. Oh, they haven't played anybody yet. That doesn't mean they're not good. It just means they haven't played anybody <laughs> yeah, yet. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, you know, when you see teams, oh, they, they, they haven't played it So what? You know, or Stanford is battle-tested, and I give them credit for that. And... Oregon isn't, and we have to devalue them slightly. But we don't want to say Oregon didn't play anyone, therefore they stink. No, you know, or therefore everything's a fraud. Now Herbert's a real deal. Yeah, sure, uh, I believe that. I believe that. And, yeah. And Stanford's got a key injury uh, this week. The linebacker Casey Tuhill. Uh, you know, he's their speed guy on the outside. Okay. He's been a difference maker so far. He's not going to play. Okay. And when you lose your speed guy on the outside against Oregon, that's a problem. 
But we talk about programs. You know, I talk about Michigan State as a program, and maybe not where it was five years ago. Boy, Oregon, you know, front and center on that list. You can't go through multiple coaching upheavals without significant losses. And, you know, it's an Oregon team that went from Chip Kelly to Mark Helfrich to Willie Taggart to Mario Cristobal in basically, you know, I mean, Chip Kelly was there in 2012. Yeah. So we're talking about there's four coaching changes uh-huh. uh, in a you know in a relatively short span of time, including three the last three years. That takes its toll on teams, and I can understand why the money's coming to the Cardinals so far this week. Yeah, I mean the the, the Ducks are getting two points at home, and and uh, but uh, they are what one and three against the spread as a home dog, and and they've only been a home dog uh, three times since 2009. Uh, so there's that. Uh, anyway, by the way. Stanford has beaten Oregon by a combined 101 to 34 in the last two years. So they have just annihilated the Ducks both in Autzen, in Eugene, uh, and in Stanford. So uh, whether or not you know Oregon has some payback or not, I don't believe that after a second year. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, coaching edge definitely to Stanford. But Bryce Love has got to be healthy. Uh, if he is, then Stanford's definitely the team to beat here. If he's not, uh, then they're going to be susceptible. Oregon could win this game. So Yeah, the, uh, again, from the reports I was reading uh, from the local sources this week is that Bryce Love is 100%. Okay, we'll see. Game. Then first time he, uh, he goes one-on-one with a defender, he better get by him. All right, <laughs> let's go to uh, the NFL. And uh, let's start, first of all, with San Francisco at Kansas City. You know, it, it's funny how things have changed with not not just social media, but just all the channels uh, on TV. And me being, again, in the media, this is what I do. I like to find out what everybody's saying, and most of the time it's annoying, and especially this week. I know I like Patrick Mahomes. I think he's a fine young quarterback, but just stop already, all right? It's just amazing how everybody in football – just goes nuts after every single game one way or another. It's either the season's over or you're a Hall of Famer. It's just it's ridiculous. And Patrick Mahomes is going to have a point in his season. Could be this week. I don't know. Probably not. But there'll be a point in the season sometime soon where he ain't going to play well. And we'll find out what happens uh, when that time comes. But, hey, he's hot. The Chiefs are uh, playing great football. The Niners, I'm not sure they could stop uh, Mahomes either. Uh, but you know what? I don't think the Chiefs can stop uh, Jimmy Garoppolo. So uh, this is gonna be. I think this should be a fun game to watch. Big spread, six points. Uh, and you know what? Also, uh, Andy Reid. He loves to win those games that you don't think he's gonna win. But then when he's at home, and I haven't looked at the numbers. Maybe you've got him, and maybe I'm wrong. But I always have the feeling that every time he's in that spot, that you expect him to win those games. That's when the Chiefs probably don't do their best. And so I actually think the Niners wouldn't be a bad play. The only reason I'm not taking them, or if I don't take them, is because of the fact that if I don't, if I don't think they can win the game. Because in the NFL, if I don't, if I don't believe you're going to win the game, I'm not taking you. Uh, but you know what? I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Niners won the game, and the money line is going to be pretty juicy for, for an NFL game. But uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, what do you think? Well, I mean, NFL money lines, when you talk about uh, the dogs in – the range of San Francisco it tends to be plus 230, plus 240. Sure. That's right what we're seeing uh, with uh, the 49ers uh, this week at Arrowhead in Kansas City. The, the, the math, uh, uh, the long-term angles uh, on the teams that win outright as underdogs the first two games of the season then return home for week three, there have actually been money winners at home uh, in that third game. Uh, there's two teams in that role this week, Tampa. Okay. Uh, and Kansas City, both of whom pulled back-to-back road upsets. Who? Uh, and now uh, uh, back-to-back upsets, I should say. So it's and, back-to-back and upsets. Home. Yeah, it's back-to-back. And then, back, uh, yeah. and then your third game, you're the favorite. And the third, the third, just third game. Third game, you they covered sixty after back-to-back upsets, upsets. to open the season. season. Correct. Okay. In Got their it. third game, teams have covered this. Uh, and I, I'm only interested in 21st century numbers. I don't look sure. at you know database results. Tampa is a favorite now, by the way. Uh, or, or you're just saying cover. Tampa's one. They're about a one point dog. Right so it's now, cover. One, one it doesn't matter if they're a favorite or not. It's just they will, they will cover that third game if they are if they've outright 
uh, pulled off uh, two upsets. Was it two upsets? Underdog win game uh, one, uh, underdog win game two. Got it. Third game you cover about 61% of the time. Okay. Uh, and there's a decent sample size for that. So okay. it has been, you know, you say, oh, undervalued, oh, they overvalued, oh, they let down. Well, no, no, they don't. Uh, they, they tend to be, you know, the undervalued teams coming into the campaign, like Kansas City, the market don't necessarily catch up with them right away. And what do you think about uh, uh, how is statistically Andy Reid anything that you get a feel for when he is in a spot like I mentioned? You know, he always, of course, he always lets everybody down in the playoffs usually. Uh, but anything re- regarding him as a home favorite, no, no, no glaring numbers you've noticed. Reid's Reed's money making role is a road underdog role. Okay, uh, and in fact, there's only two head coaches in the NFL. Uh, with their current teams that have straight up winning records as road underdogs, one of them's Belichick, the other one's Reed. Interesting. Uh, I so that you know, one. for all of his playoff failures, uh, Andy Reid in the regular season has made me a lot of money over the years. Look, Kansas City's running this Texas Tech offense. They're literally. Yeah. I mean, when you think about Andy Reid, uh-huh. all right, they, this guy, I, I just Wikipedia him. He, he started his first. He was an assistant in college, and he started in the NFL in 1992. Andy Reid has been developing this year's offense for Kansas City for the last 26 years, uh-huh. literally. Yeah. Every player on Kansas City, all of them, they're all his guys. He said, I want Mahomes, not Smith. Oh, I want Sammy Watkins. Hey, let's draft Tyree. Every one of them, let's draft Kareem Hunt. Every one of these guys is the guy that Andy Reid said, I want for this role in this offense. Sure, yeah. Okay. So this, of all the teams he's had in Philadelphia and Kansas City, this is the one that every guy is his guy. <laughs> uh, that everything was designed by him, for him, for this. It's a, it's a, I don't know how teams are going to stop it. I really don't. When you're talking about basketball on grass, when you're talking about running five guys out on every play, you know, with game-breaking speed, at multiple positions, I don't know how you stop that. You got to blow up the offensive line, and, uh, and we haven't seen anyone able to do that yet for KC. So, good luck to San Fran. That being said, you know the 49ers were up 30 to 13 against the Lions last week, and then barely hung on for a 37 27, 30 to 27 win. And you read the quotes after the game. You know Richard Sherman talking. About, it feels like we lost. You know we can't ever do that again. Uh, San Fran's coming to play this week. Uh, and if you're coming to play against Kansas City, that means you're chucking the football around. Look, we don't see teams change the paradigm in the NFL very often. The last team I remember to do that was the uh, St. Louis Rams under Dick Vermeil. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden you stopped, you started seeing totals in the 50s for the first time yeah. in the NFL. Well, this Chiefs team, maybe they should have their totals in the 60s. Because <laughs> that defense is every bit as bad as the offense is good. Sure. Uh, and the markets won't get there. You know, 55 and a half, all that, 56. Markets won't get to 60 on an NFL team. Won't happen. It'll take eight overs in a row for Kansas City uh, to get to 60. And you know what? I'm betting the Chiefs over every week until proven otherwise. Yeah. I think there the team go. is mistotaled. That's, uh, that's a smart play then. Uh, let's get to Baltimore at home against Denver. They're about a five, six-point favorite. Uh, first road game of the season for Denver. And uh, even though we and we talked about Denver as being a, a team that uh, could make the playoffs this year, or they could uh, bounce back. Uh, uh, but but they're kind of doing it in ways that I really didn't think they'd do it. I mean, if I if I would have seen two and zero when the season started, I'd be like, yeah, that's that's what I kind of thought. But not what how they've done it. I mean, I I, I expected the defense to be a little bit better. Uh, and as far as the way they've won, uh, especially last week, I mean, they're very, very fortunate to, to win last week's game against Oakland. Now they're going to go on the road for the first time, and Baltimore coming off a loss. Uh, I think Baltimore's for real. Uh, I, five, five and a half points, again, it's, it's a pretty big number. Uh, but, look, same thing. If I like Denver, then, then that's one thing. But uh, since, you know, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't worry about giving up five or six points if I like the team to win either in the NFL. Uh, but I don't know. Still a tough one, you know, uh, to give up that many points against a Denver team that's playing pretty good football and has a pretty good defense. So, what do you think about this game? I think Denver stinks. You know, I mean, look who they played. They played Seattle, a four-win team, and Oakland, a four-win team, and they barely won those games at home. Sure. Um, you know, yeah. I, I mean, this is a this is a step up in class for the Broncos. 
you remember what Denver did in Vance Joseph's first season on the highway? No. They got crushed every game, yeah. game after game. They went one and seven straight up. Uh, I think it was one and they might have covered another spread. <laughs> uh, I think it was one and seven straight up in ATS. The one okay. win they got came at Indy. You know, right. uh, who wasn't a good team uh, last year, and you know, six of the seven losses by double digits. Uh-huh. All seven by a touchdown or more. Um, non-competitive. Sure. Now this year they have a quarterback, kind of. In, in Case Keenum, who's looked very much like the career backup that he was prior to last That's year. That's true. That's true. And you have Baltimore with extra time to repair coming off a Thursday night debacle. You have uh, Flacco and Harbaugh at home in September. Boy, these guys have been money winners uh, in early season. And really? you say, oh, the Ravens. I like dogs in Ravens games. Yeah, I do too. But okay. when I'm laying less than a touchdown against a team that I think isn't any good and is being priced like they're a competitive squad, I'm interested to be Baltimore pass for me. All right. And then uh, the final game is the one out West in L.A., L.A. versus L.A. Uh, as a fan, I'm very disappointed. No uh, Joey Bosa. I would really like to see the Chargers because I, 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 I think that th- this is still an outside chance. And I always say outside chance because L.A. Chargers, L.A. Rams, Super Bowl con- sounds kind of weird. Uh, but talent-wise, I think this could be a Super Bowl matchup, talent-wise, but no Bosa. So that, that's disappointing because the Chargers are going to need everybody that they could get their hands on talent-wise to beat this Ram team. Seven-point favorite. Uh, you know, Phillip Rivers plays – he always seems to play his best, though, in these games, and especially if he's on the road and, 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 and they're heavy dogs. I, I, you always seem to get the best out of Phillip Rivers. Uh I, I don't know. This is a tough one. I mean, again, I don't like taking dogs for the points if I think they could win. I don't know. I don't know if the Chargers can win this one without Bosa the way the Rams are looking right now. What do you think? Well, the Rams are looking good. Again, we just talked about who, uh, uh, gee, who did Denver play. You know, who the Rams play? They played the same Raiders team that I called 4-12, and 12, and they played true. an Arizona team that will be lucky to go 4-12. and 12. True. So from a value standpoint, this is not a great value spot with the L.A. Rams. You know, they have blowout wins over two very bad teams, and now they're stepping up in class. That being said, the Rams, I'm a Rams believer. You know, my power rings have the Rams as the best team in the oh, NFL. It's, it's not really that close. Too much talent, yeah. It's not, and, and the, I mean, this is the only thing that stops the Rams, injuries, because their depth isn't there. They have a lot of money tied up in the front-line talent. Yeah. Uh, but as long as they're healthy, the Rams are the team to beat in the NFC and probably the whole NFL. So they're not a team I'm in any rush to step in front of. I get the big bet on the Rams laying two touchdowns last week, and now I'm telling you, that was oh, yeah. easy as it gets. Yeah, that's you know? true. Uh, <laughs> there was were, not, yeah, I had it, them too. Yeah, they were my It was not picks. a sweat. Yeah. Uh, I'll just put it that way. Sure. But, yeah, again, you talk about teams and their roles. What role do I want the Chargers in? I yeah. want the Chargers catching points. That's right. You know, uh, I sure do. Uh, this has been where Phillip Rivers has excelled. Yep. Uh, and the Chargers can come in through the back door if they fall behind. They have got the passing game. They, you know, and not that they played the toughest of slates in early season play. They're certainly a step in class defensively, but uh, they, nobody's played an easier against slate than the Rams so far. So uh, from a pure value standpoint, I look at the Rams and say this team deserves it to be a Super Bowl favorite, and I don't like to step in front of these teams. But at plus seven, you know, that's an attractive price. It is. Uh, to look at the Chargers. Not a game I'm really or I'm going to bet. Uh, I can't imagine getting involved in this one before kickoff unless this line moves significantly. But certainly an interesting game to consider and a breakdown. By the way, before I let you go, uh, what is your take on, uh, on, on, on this? What would you do with this big Monday night game? Or, or what kind of a feeling do you have of how much longer this is going to last for Fitzpatrick? Because I don't think it's going to last much longer. I uh, I know Ryan Fitzpatrick, and he's eventually going to come back down to life. And uh, I don't know if Pittsburgh's the team, though, uh, because I didn't pick Pittsburgh to make the playoffs this year. We went over that, uh, and this is the reason why. It was predictable that the Steelers were going to have all sorts of internal issues, and it's showing on the football field. Uh, but but I mean, shouldn't shouldn't it shouldn't it be easy where you say to yourself in these types of games, don't overthink it. Tampa Bay's hot. Fitzpatrick's hot. Pittsburgh's in turmoil. Nothing's going right. Tampa Bay's at home. It, the numbers practically even. Just don't overthink it and take Tampa Bay. Is it, is, is it that easy, or do you go into why would I take Tampa Bay? Pittsburgh's clearly a better team, and I'm getting pick 'em here, and they haven't won a game yet this year, and they're totally desperate. 
Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's what makes handicapping the conundrum <laughs> that it is, all right? If it was easy, yeah. everyone would be rich, and all the bookmakers would be out of business. They wouldn't be allowed to bet anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's never easy. Uh-huh. And when I say never, I mean never, yeah. you know? And this game is a classic example. Okay, look ahead line here was Pittsburgh minus four. Okay. Right, so last week before the games were played, okay. the Steelers are four-point favorites in Tampa. Okay. Now let me ask you this. Take off the uniforms. Yeah. Make a point spread based on what the two teams have done in 2018. Uh, Tampa Bay 7. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> there's a conundrum there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's a dichotomy there. Uh-huh. What is real with uh, – let's start with the with Fitzpatrick thing because you said something I've been saying on every show I've done all week, which is we've seen Ryan Fitzpatrick before. He didn't suddenly become a new quarterback. No. What's happened the first two weeks, and it's happened consistently, is – uh, receivers have gotten open behind the secondary. He can chuck it deep. But when receivers aren't open running behind the secondary, what does Ryan Fitzpatrick do? He just chucks it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they get picked off. Uh, in my mind, the question here isn't Tampa. The question is Pittsburgh. Sure, because sure. Tampa, yeah. look, for, for as, as much success as the Bucs have had, you know, the Bucs, uh, whatever, they're, they're eight and eight, you know. I agree. Yeah. They're, that's, they're, that's their, that's but their... Pittsburgh – is either going to turn this season around this week or it's over. I mean, this is now or never time. Yep. And a lot of times in this spot, I'm real comfortable back in the team that has their backs, backs against, against the wall. wall. Yeah. And has, you know, everyone tell them they stink and, you know, and then they don't stink and they're ready to show somebody they don't stink. Sure. Jeez, I don't get that sense from the Steelers, man. I'm not confident. It's tough. It's tough yeah. I'm not confident that that locker room is going to fix itself. Not, no. I'm not confident that the, the, the key guys care enough to, to sacrifice for the team. And that, for me, is a clear reason why I won't be, you know, I have no intention of getting involved in this game. Certainly not uh, on the side. Total-wise, you may look at the over. Uh, and you know, the funny thing is this, this whole nonsense started the week before they lost to Jacksonville. It, 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 as far as just, it, and it hasn't stopped, as far as the whole looking ahead to New England nonsense. I mean, they have so many, so they're, they're so undisciplined, thanks to Mike Tomlin, as far as talking to the media and letting shit out. You know, it's the exact opposite of Bill Belichick, which is why they always lose to New England. Uh, they just, they don't know. No, Tomlin they lost to New England last year because the refs took the game-winning touchdown away <laughs> on a play that doesn't, that will baff, that continues to baffle me. As I watch it again and again, and I saw the touchdowns that got called last week, that's, I mean, the, the, the refs last year said, here, New England, we want you guys to win, and literally took the game from Pittsburgh. That wasn't because of Tomlin. It was because of a, a, a crazy flag. And this whole anti-Tomlin stuff that's out there, everyone's taking shots at a head coach who's been successful, extraordinarily successful, two rings uh, for uh, Mr. Tomlin on his fingers. Um, you know, he's a great NFL head coach, and the fact that everyone is taking shots at him, he's just an easy target right now because Pittsburgh's off to a, to a, a rough start. Yeah, I, I, but, you know, I think that, though, is the main reason, is all the undiscipline around him. That's it. It's not, it's not, it's not wins or losses. It's not, they haven't won any big games in the last several years, so you know how it is. Uh, everybody wants to know what happened yesterday. And then this team is completely undisciplined. These guys just won't shut up. They have three playoff wins the last three years. Well, I'm talking big wins. Okay, so playoff wins aren't big, big enough? No, not when you beat Miami. No. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's a big win, but you, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying. I mean, yeah, it's I like it's, they, they have a very talented football team. And, they uh, have a very talented and offensive skill position group of players. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing with the defense is <laughs> I honestly, when I look at them on paper, I don't see them being that bad. They have a very good front. It's like, you know, and when you play a 3-4 defense, you have a, you have, they have one of the best talented 3-4 defensive lines in football. How can they be that bad? You know, it's 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 just I don't. There's something wrong there. I don't know what they don't know what it is. They can't figure it out. So anyway, but that's uh, that that's for Pittsburgh to figure out. And if they can't stop the Bucks this week, then uh, like you said, then then, then who knows uh, what's uh, maybe they'll go out. What do you think, Le'Veon Bell? If they if they lose this week, nothing, what right? Nothing. Because they're, they're not bringing him back. He's done. 
He ain't come, unless he comes back, unless he comes walking through the door. They're not bringing him back. Do you think Le'Veon Bell is the difference between the Steelers 0-1-1 and, and the Steelers 2-0? and Do I think, uh, well, hmm. against Cleveland, maybe. I don't think Le'Veon Bell makes any difference to the Pittsburgh Steelers. I don't think any running back in the NFL makes any difference, period. So, uh, if, I mean, if I'm Pittsburgh, there's no way I pay Le'Veon oh, Bell. I wouldn't pay him either. I don't think about it. I show him the door. Goodbye. Thank you very much. James Conner, you're next up. Yeah, on the clock for they're Pittsburgh. not gonna. They, yeah, they're not. They're not. They're not the type of franchise that would do that anyway. They've never done that, and nor should they. But yeah, Le'Veon Bell will be playing somewhere else. Uh, do you think they should trade him? No, uh, if you can get something for him, but nobody wants him. What would you give up for him? Nothing. I'd give up a seventh rounder, conditional. <laughs> and this is why, because you have to pay Le'Veon Bell if you get him, and if you waste your money on running backs in the NFL, it is a bad investment. Well, decision. What would you get for him? Be... So, what would you if you were a contending Super Bowl team, and mm-hmm. you knew you only needed him for the year? I mean, I don't see any reason why you'd have to strike a deal. I mean, yeah, oh, he's, sure, he's sure. got to play. If, 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 if I'm talking about a, a one-year rental. Yeah, absolutely. one-year rental. What would you give up for him? One-year rental. You're trying to win a Super Bowl. Fifth rounder. Who? Bell. Give me a team. Um, let's see who's contending. Who needs a running back? Yeah, who, who's who's a contender? Who's a contender? Team? That, I mean, it's not. It, it just doesn't exist, dude. Running backs. You find the running back you need on the waiver wire. Right, let's say Gurley. Gurley ACL. Okay, Gurley. Gurley breaks his leg tomorrow, and, yes. and yeah. What I would, but I, in, in that the situation, Rams, what would you give up for him? When you're the Rams and you're in win this that's year right. mode, yeah, that's right. I would trade. You know, that's that's probably worth a third rounder. For, third rounder. You know, okay. Yeah. All right, that makes sense. Yeah, for them, they would be that. I don't know if they have any draft picks left. They gave a whole lot away. <laughs> I know that's true. All right, Teddy, I appreciate it. Uh, we'll talk to you again next week, and uh, enjoy the football as always. And uh, uh, best of luck. Thank you. I'll take all the luck I can get. All right, you got it. That's Teddy uh, Savransky, aka Teddy Covers. You can find him on Twitter at Teddy underscore Covers. All right, so you could also find uh, all of his guaranteed picks at experts.covers.com. And Teddy's with us every Thursday. So I want to thank uh, Teddy for joining us, giving us some bonus, threw a bonus game in there, even though we really didn't pick the game. But that's okay. Like I, 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 I've, As I've mentioned before, I'm not going to sit here and... I'm not going to sit here and necessarily pick games because if that was the case then I would have asked Teddy to give me his picks and I don't the only person who gives me picks each week is Mark and that's because he's the first guy in on Wednesdays and then whatever Mark doesn't do I take that leftover stuff and I distribute it between Teddy and Mark excuse me and Dave on Fridays to make sure that I I get as many a variety because who wants to hear us talk about the same game three days in a row sure we get three different takes but this isn't the playoffs the playoffs that's different Three different takes, that's important. And if there was some mammoth, unbelievable game this week, you know, like, I don't know, Patriots and who would it be? Patriots and Eagles, something like that. Then I'd get a take on everybody. But I, variety is better at this time of year. And uh, and as you can see, I don't even know which games. I can't even remember out of the six games which ones Teddy actually picked. But it's about analysis and just trying to give you both sides. And uh, hopefully we've done that properly this week and every week. Again, we'll be back uh, tomorrow with Dave Koken, and that'll be a 1 o'clock show. And uh, we've got three more college and three more pro games to go before the weekend. Trying to see here if uh, we have anybody else tomorrow. No, Dave's the only one uh, tomorrow with me at 1 o'clock. By the way, coming up, Mitch Light from Athlon. Uh, we got our college football coverage every Thursday, every Thursday afternoon with Mitch Light from Athlon Sports. So uh, Mitch will be with me to, to take a look at a lot of what's going on in college football last week and this week. So uh, more variety coming up with Mitch Light from Athlon Sports. We're actually going to do some predictions. We'll take a look at our preseason predictions, and we're going to kind of re-predict now that we've got some games to watch. We'll look at the updated futures, Heisman, uh, and like I said, take a look at some of the key things that happened last week and what's going on this week. That's coming up on OFN College Football Weekly here on a Thursday. But for Ted Savransky, I'm Greg DePama. Also, thanks to Owen Buchanan. 
Texas A&M writer at texags.com for joining us here on your lads football network. You know the drill. Alpha, Mike, Foxtrot.